And that was the moment at which it became clear to everyone who was watching this with a shrewd enough eye that we were not dealing with objective science, but with a politically biased organisation with an agenda which included its own survival and which therefore had to say that there was a problem when the scientists had actually said there wasn't a problem. Now these episodes, and many others like them which I could have quoted, raised in my mind, when I was first researching this, the possibility that the IPCC is indeed politically motivated to state a particular case regardless of the scientific truth. And I therefore began examining its documents myself. And I came across, in the 2007 report, of which I got the final draft which was reviewed by the scientists, um, an error so as to magnify tenfold the influence of climate change, supposed, on the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. Here they are here. Now you can see if you add up these numbers here, they do not come to the IPCC's total. Why? Because the decimal points here that should be over here are, uh, they've just multiplied all these numbers by 10. These four red numbers, they've all been multiplied by 10 when they shouldn't have been. Now this is a document which we are told was reviewed and scrutinised by two and a half thousand scientists and reviewed by governments. Clearly, it was not. Downright, outright dishonesty and gross scientific inaccuracy to exaggerate tenfold the likely ice melt from those two ice caps. Now these and other errors raise very serious questions about whether there is or even can be a consensus. We're told there's a scientific consensus and Al Gore even tries to tell us that that consensus is unanimous. So do the learned papers of scientists in climate and related fields uniformly predict the catastrophes uniformly predicted by the BBC and other media which have taken formal in BBC's case or informal decisions to abandon any semblance of objectivity. No. A survey of 539 papers containing the words global climate change and published between 2004 and mid-February 2007 found that only one of the papers even mentioned the possibility that global warming might be catastrophic and even that paper offered no evidence whatsoever in support of the imagined catastrophe. So given this absence of alarm in the peer-reviewed literature, where did this panic start? Well, let's begin with a graph of 1988. Now, this was put forward by James Hansen, now the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for S Space Studies, in the very hot summer of that year, before the Senate in Washington. And I've made it a little clearer for you by that's what had happened <coughs> And then we get the predictions from the blue sky section of the graph from 1988 onwards. And we can see some very extreme predictions. Look at this case A there, the worst case. Then you get his um, likely outturn. This was his kind of best estimate of what would happen. And then you get an interesting one where he says, what happens if we gradually reduce the amount of CO2 from 88 until 2000? And then in 2000, we stabilise it and there are no longer any increases in CO2. And this, the green dotted graph here, is the one that he gets where it begins actually quite quickly to level off. Well, now, what actually has happened in the climate? We're now going to look at that and here it is. And you can see that basically what's happened is that most of the way along, it has been tracking at or below the CO stabilisation figure. And it's currently here and I think that by the end of this year, it's going to be more or less still online with that one, right at the bottom of his range of predictions. So temperature hasn't increased as much as Hansen told Congress it would. Therefore, this question arises, are today's temperatures, historically speaking, exceptional? Now, the first question I think we need to ask here is, has it been warmer than this before? One has heard in history of a medieval warm period when you could grow wine grapes in Scotland. You certainly can't do that now. They used to grow in Yorkshire. My family had estates there at about that time. The Vikings 
were farming places in Greenland, which are now under permafrost. If you go to their major settlement in Greenland at Valse, the place where they buried their bodies is now under permafrost. It certainly wasn't under per permafrost when they buried them. So we know, therefore, that in Greenland, in Europe, when the great cathedrals were built, in Britain, there was a medieval warm period. So now what we're going to do is look at what the UN's report in 1990 uh, said about the medieval warm period. It produced this graph, which I have colorized so you can see it clearly. Here is a thing showing the medieval warm period, and it was labeled by the IPCC as medieval warm period. It's very plainly visible there. Here is the little ice age during the Maunder minimum when there were no sunspots on the sun for about 60 years and the temperatures went down. And here is the, the current period. Um, eventually it's going to go up a bit, but it's still a long way below what was shown in the IPCC's 1990 graph. Now, just 11 years later, in 2001, this graph appeared, no medieval warm period. Just like that, as Tommy Cooper might say. It vanished, it disappeared. And so we get this, what they call the hockey stick graph. It runs along, all the way like this, and then, wee, it goes up here, as though this is somehow exceptional. Now, the UN, the IPCC, they were really pleased with this graph. They printed it six times, large and in full colour, in their 2001 report. The only graph to appear six times. The only graph to appear in full colour six times. The question then arises, uh, how did they achieve this remarkable result in just 11 years to wipe out all the historical records, all the enormous number of papers in the scientific literature attesting in one way or another to the existence of a medieval warm period all around the world. How did they do it? Here's one of the things they did. They took um, a particular type of data, a particular data set, and here it is from Sheep Mountain, California, and this particular data set has a very satisfactory, from their point of view, hockey stick shape. Up it goes at the end there the blade of the hockey stick, and the shank along there. But this one, from Maybury Slough in Arizona, doesn't have that. It has a sort of peak in 1800, but then otherwise it's more or less jogging along, all in a straight line. So what did they do? They gave this data 390 times as much weighting in their computer program as they gave this data, because this data gave them the shape they wanted to have. It's an extraordinary thing. They then went on and left out the tree ring data set that included the medieval warm period. Because if you put it back in, then it showed that the medieval warm period was actually there. They said they'd included the data set they'd left out. They published a paper in Nature, 1998, and again in 1999. They said they'd included that data set, but they hadn't. They'd actually left it out. They'd hidden the missing data, in a file which was marked on their own computer, where it was later found by two diligent researchers from Canada, they'd hidden it in a file marked censored data. That's what they'd done with it, censored data. They inserted their own estimates in place of the censored data, but did not publish or tell anyone the fact that they had done so. If the omitted data were reinserted, bingo! The vanished medieval warm period reappeared. Here is where it comes. Suddenly the medieval warm period is back. Now the way the scientific method works is that if somebody puts forward a hypothesis that there was a hockey stick shaped graph and there was no medieval warm period, they must make their data and their methods freely, fully, immediately and widely available so that tiresome nuisances like me can check to see whether they did the sums right, which in this case, alas, they didn't. A report by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States also confirmed that the graph was defective, saying that its conclusions were no better than plausible at best, and that it had a validation skill not significantly different from zero. But none of this, however much we may attack this graph, none of this tells us whether there was a medieval warm period. So now we're going to look at a few slides that establish where it is in the literature. Now this is done by taking 6,000 borehole uh, temperature readings from all over the world. 
course, this is not what the actual temperature was, but it gives you a rough idea that, yes, there was a medieval warm period, and yes, there was uh, a little ice age. And then we move on to an isotope study of a stalagmite from Spannagel Cave in the Austrian Alps. Another stalagmite, Cold Air Cave, Makabanskat Valley in South Africa. Lots of these papers are showing the medieval warm period. But when I first wrote on this, I was accused by various sort of militant websites on this subject of cherry-picking. So, let's just see a few more, shall we? Just so you can see I'm not cherry-picking. Let's go to the Li Chao Peninsula from South China. Let's go to the Northwestern Arabian Sea. Let's go to the Sargasso Sea, to New Zealand, to the North Island of New Zealand, to the Spanish Pyrenees, to Northern Fennoscandia, to the Swiss Alps, three of them there, to Canada, let's go to British Columbia, let's go to the Azores, let's go to coastal Peru, let's go to coastal Peru again, just for fun. Let's go all the way to the summit of the Greenland ice sheet, 